John the Mouse. In March 2012, this little red caboose was donated to the Old Depot Museum. Just northwest of the depot, railroad cars were manufactured and locomotives were serviced with a roundhouse and turntable. In 1888, Kansas City, Lawrence, and Southern Kansas was leasing much of the line to Atchison, Topeka, and the Santa Fe Railroad. By 1895, the Santa Fe Railroad purchased the line and in 1962 donated the depot building to the Franklin County Historical Society for use as a museum. In 1995, the AT and SF merged with the Burlington Northern to become the Burlington Northern Santa Fe. George P. Washburn was the architect of this depot. Old Depot Museum. This building, constructed in 1888, served as a division headquarters of the Southern Kansas Railway. This was a subsidiary and later became a part of the Santa Fe system. When the Santa Fe moved into a new station, the old stone depot, which had served the traveling public for three quarters of a century, was given by the Santa Fe to the Franklin County Historical Society. The city park once stood on both sides of Main Street. However, the city fathers soon offered the west side for educational purposes. And in 1903, the Carnegie Library was built on the east side. Listen to the stories of the Potawatomi Massacre as told by its victims' families and neighbors. Mahela Doyle, wife and mother of three massacre victims. We were all in bed when we heard some persons come into the yard and rap at the door and call oh, Mr. Doyle, my husband. This was about 11 o'clock on Saturday night, the 24th of May last. My husband got up and went to the door. Those outside inquired for Mr. Wilkinson and where he lived. My husband said he would tell them. Mr. Doyle, my husband, and several men came into the house and they said they were from the army. My husband was a pro-slavery man. They told my husband that he and the boys must surrender. They were the prisoners. The men were armed with pistols and large knives. 
They first took my husband out of the house, then took two of my sons, William and Drew Rio, and then took them away. My son John was spared because I asked them in tears to spare him. In a short time afterwards, I heard the report of pistols. I heard two reports, after which I heard moaning as if a person was dying. Then I heard a wild whoop. They had asked before they went away for our horses. We told them that our horses were out on the prairie. My husband and two boys, my sons, did not come back anymore. I went out next morning in search of them and found my husband and William, my son, lying dead in the road near together, about 200 yards from my house. They were buried the next day. On the day of the burying, I saw the dead body of Drury, my own boy. Fear for myself and the remaining children induced me to leave the home where we had been living. We had improved our claim a little. I left them at the state of Missouri. Judge James Hanway, friend of John Brown and local historian. I was personally acquainted with the Doyles, Wilkinsons, and Sherman, and I am fully satisfied, as everybody else is who lived on the creek in 56, that a base conspiracy was on foot to drive out, burn, and kill. In a word, the Potawatomi Creek, from its mouth to its fountainhead, was to be feared of every man child who was for Kansas being a free state. I heard one of the Shermans declare that he would rather take the life of certain free state men on the creek than kill a rattlesnake. I heard Squire Morris relate the threats made by the Zoyers and also by the Shermans because he sold some powder and lead to our military company. Take the in connection the fact of John Brown running in the border ruffian camp with his surveying instruments and there hearing the plans on foot to drive out and exterminate the settlers on our creek. And I think we have good and sufficient testimony to believe that our lives were in danger and that John Brown and his little band saved us from a premature grave. Louisa Jane Wilkinson, wife of massacre victim Alan Wilkinson. On the night of the 24th of May, 1856, between the hours of midnight and daybreak, a party of men came to the house where we were residing and forcibly carried my husband away. They took him in the name of the Northern Army, and that next morning he was found about 150 yards from the house, dead. I was very ill at the time of measles. I begged them to let Mr. Wilkinson stay with me, saying that I was sick and helpless and could not stay by myself. My husband also asked them to let him stay with me until he could get someone to wait on me, told them that he would not run off, but he would be there the next day or whenever called for. The old man who seemed to be in command looked at me and then around at the children and replied, You have neighbors. I said, so I have, but they are not here and I cannot go for them. The old man replied, it matters not, and told him to get ready. My husband wanted to put on his boots and get ready so as to be protected from the damp and night air, but they would not let him. They then took my husband away. After they were gone, I thought I heard my husband's voice in complaint. Next morning, Mr. Wilkinson's body was found about 150 yards from the house in some dead brush. A lady who saw my husband's body said that there was a gash in his head and side. Others said he was cut in the throat twice. The Reverend Samuel Adair, brother-in-law of John Brown. At first I condemned the killings on Pottawatomie Creek as base, barbarous, and horrible murder but later I concluded that they were necessary. The slain men were the worst type of pro-slaveryites. They were vicious individuals who had threatened to burn down Free Staters' cabins with the occupants inside if necessary. They had boasted that they would, quote, clear the entire region of the damned abolitionists, end quote. Mahela Doyle. 
John Brown told us if a man stood between him and what he considered right, he would take a life as coolly as he would eat his breakfast. With an eye like a snake, he looked like a demon. What you have heard are actual words spoken or written by residents along Pottawatomie Creek in May of 1856. Stories told about the murders reflect the speaker's different viewpoints. Now we want to ask you for yours. What would you have done? Outside this exhibit, you will find a ballot and a ballot box. Please take the time to give us your thoughts about this violent local event. Bennett Creamery was built up by B.D. Bennett and his family. The operation produced ice cream novelties, ice cream, buttermilk, powder milk, powdered egg whites and yolks, condensed milk, whole, skim, and sweetened, ice cream mix, and ice milk mix. Most of the Dairy Queens in Kansas and western Missouri bought their ice milk mix from the Bennetts. They sold 20 million gallons of liquid Dairy Queen mix before 1969. The volume of milk produced reached over 100 million pounds per year received from 2,000 dairy farmers. The peak number of employees was 125. 22 floods disrupted the operations during the life of the company. The plant was open 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, and there was no locks on the door. Train delivery was important until about 1950 when a shift was completed to refrigerated trucks and tank trailers. The milk was received at the plant in 10 gallon milk cans until about 1958 when a gradual change was made into a tank trucks. All farms were converted to refrigerated bulk tanks by the early 1970s. In the early days, frozen river ice was cut in chunks and packed in sawdust to use during the hot months. By the 1880s, ice was produced commercially. The ice came from Bennett's Ice Company from 1990s until 1951. The ice was delivered to homes and businesses in horse-drawn wagons. The production plant was on Main Street and was destroyed by the 1951 flood. One of the biggest customers of Bennett Ice Company was the Santa Fe Railroad, which stopped refrigerated cars for re-icing en route from west coast to east. The rail cars were called bunker cars. The Hall Dollhouse was built by Ernie Hall, a man who worked for the railroad. He met his future wife, Annie, in England during World War II. Her maiden name was also Hall. She came to this country as a war bride, and they had two children. Annie loved dollhouses all her life. When she set out to create this one, she wanted it to resemble an elaborate one she had played with, as an early child in England. She and Ernie had to eat off TV trays for two years while their kitchen table was in use as a workshop. Once the house last tiny shingle was in place, Annie began to collect the furniture which fills the rooms. She donated the dollhouse to the Old Depot Museum in 1997. 
It was installed in the late 2000. The case is a donation from the Rotary Foundation and the Midwest Cabinets. We thank them as well as Mr. and Mrs. Hall. Thank you for watching my video. I do have more for you to view. Just press on the button. And if you'd like to subscribe to stay up to date, you can push that button too.